welcome to the Fish Nerds, a show about fish, fishing, and eating fish. I'm Clay Groves, Chief Executive Fish Nerds, Licensed Fishing Guide, and your host. I'm so happy you're here. I'm glad you're listening, and I can't wait to tell you about tonight's show. Today on the show, we're going to start with a little bit of Stump the Fish Nerds. Then we get to hang out with Nate Hill, President President of the New Hampshire Chapter of the Native Fish Coalition. He's going to tell us all about saving brook trout and other trout species. Uh, he's also a New Hampshire fly guide at whitemountainflyfishing.com. Then, Doc Martin is with us, and she spent some time talking worms with the great Dr. Snyder at greatlakeswormwatch.org. So, very exciting night tonight. Stay tuned. This episode is brought to you by the Fish Nerds Guide Service. That's right. We are here and ready to bring your family on a guided trip on a state-of-the-art brand-new pontoon fishing butt. Yep, fishing butt. <laughs> fishing boat. Yep, I said pontoon boat. This is a comfortable but serious fishing machine. We can troll for lake trout and salmon, cast for bass, or cruise into a cove and put the herd of some perch and panfish. Head to fishnerds.com for rates or call me at 603-986-4335 for booking. We are the only guide service in the Mount Washington Valley that can bring your whole family fishing. So get on it. Also, if you want to just kind of go on a boat ride, you can just rent me and the boat out at an hourly rate. We'll take you out. We'll be doing sunset cruises every night. This is in the Mount Washington Valley, New Hampshire. Come on up and see us. It's a pretty place. We've got good fishing here. This episode's also brought to you by Thirst Productions. It's a one-man digital media empire catering to small businesses by helping them improve their online presence from websites to search engine optimization, SEO, social media to targeted advertising, website analytics to website maintenance. Rich helps businesses speak to customers more efficiently. Thirst Productions also gives back to cold water fishy conservation projects by working with select nonprofits at deeply discounted rates to help them better share their message. So, if you're a small business or a podcaster who needs a digital facelift, or if you work with a nonprofit in need of a new online presence, get in touch with Rich at thirstproductions.com. And we are looking for more su- supporters. If you want to support us and advertise with us, head to Fish Nerds, email clay at fishnerds.com. Okay, now time for a little bit of Stump the Fish Nerd. We're here. We are here to take all your fishy questions. If you want to get your question on the show, call 607-378-FISH. 607-378-FISH. First up, we got a call from Russ from Maine. Here's Russ. Hey, guys. My name is Russ. I'm calling as a listener in Maine. Um, I'm loving the podcast. Um, usually I, I try to get, uh, to listen, you know, to every single one of them. Um, even if it's ones that I don't usually, you know, fish that I don't usually fish for, or if it, um, or if it's things I don't usually do, I still love listening to you guys because I do learn a lot. Um, I've been subscribed for about four or five months now. Um, I love the segments where you take calls and Facebook questions um, from different listeners. Uh, so here is my question. Um, I'm actually interested in possibly guiding um, or, like, stepping into the fishing business. So what advice would you give someone who's been fishing, fishing for their, you know, their whole life? Um, I do know quite a bit about fishing. Um, I bring a lot of my buddies. I've actually got a few of my friends started fishing. Um, and we have been stepping into tournaments and doing stuff like that. So I'm looking to actually guide um, and or start an online tackle business. That's something me and my friends are looking forward to doing here in the future. Um, so, yeah, I'd love to um, – I'd love it if you guys would answer my question. Um, that would be excellent. Um, and I look forward to uh, talking with you guys soon. Keep up the good work. Okay, so Russ wants to know some advice about becoming a fishing guide or open an online tackle business. Um, first of all, the online tackle business, good luck. <laughs> Have fun with that one. Now, you got to compete with people like Amazon and Fish USA and all kinds of other big companies. 
So if you're going to do it, be very, very niche and targeted. Of course, advertise with fish nerds, but good luck on that one. Um, last fall, we made a series about how to become a licensed fishing guide. You can head to fishnerds.com to this show notes for this show, and I'll have the links to those stories. Russ, I advise you to take some time and listen to those episodes. That will get you a long way towards becoming a guide. But So, Russ, you love to fish, and you love taking your friends fishing. Uh, but that's not, <laughs> that's really great, but that's not all there is, uh, when it comes to becoming a, a, a fishing guide, there's a lot more to it. Maine is known to have one of the hardest guide tests in the country. I know a lot of people who go to Maine just to take that test to prove that they have the right stuff. Uh, so my advice to you, if you want to become a guide, go to guide school. You need to be an expert outdoors person. You need to learn map and compass, CPR, first aid, of course, all the laws in your state. And uh, the hardest part, one of the hardest things is lost person scenario. How do you save someone lost in the woods? I highly recommend you talk to other guides, uh, people like uh, like uh, Richard Yvonne from Twin Maple Outdoors or Captain Sean Tibbetts from MainTuneFishing.com. Both those guys are really good guides. Uh, they're going to be way too honest with you, but they will help you uh, if you have questions. Um and they're and they have been guiding a long time, so a lot of good advice for them. Um, you also, I highly recommend call one of them, go on a guided trip. But when you're fishing with them, don't think about the fishing. Watch what they're doing. Is what they're doing about fish, uh, or is it something else? I'll give you a hint. It's something else. It's customer service. Uh, when you are bringing people on um, fishing, you are a customer service person. You're all about making them comfortable and happy, and all the things that a good uh, service job can be it's it's not that different from being a waiter only there's um you know fish um <laughs> so all that said guiding is tons of fun way harder than you think and way more expensive than you think if you have more questions i'd be happy to talk with you more in fact if you want to come on the show i'd love to ch- talk to you um either in person you're just in maine or uh, in, or over the phone uh, and interview you or you can interview me for the show about how to become a guide and maybe we could put you something fun together if you want to come on my boat come on my boat and we'll do it on the boat it'll be totally fun anyway hope that helps you russ uh at least get you started uh, but do it it's fun and uh, make sure you can afford it <laughs> all right next up we get a phone call from steve from uh, north Can- country angler north country angler.com Yes, this is Steve at the North Country Angler and a Stump the Fish Nerds question. Now that there is a reproducing population of brown trout in the Saco River, how can you tell the difference between a brown trout that was born in the river and one that was added to the river by fish and game? Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Okay. If you didn't hear what he said, he wants to know how do you tell a brown trout from a from uh how do you tell a brown trout? If how how do you tell if a brown trout is a native trout or not native, a wild trout or a hatchery fish? And I'm going to tell you something. I'm not going to answer that question. And the reason I'm not going to answer it is because next up on the show, I've got Nate Hill, New Hampshire president of the Native Fish Coalition nativefishcoalition.org, and New Hampshire Fly Fishing Guide, whitemountainflyfishing.com. If you listen closely to the interview, you will hear that he answers Steve's question. Uh, And if you want to find Steve, you can find him at northcountryangler.com. And I know it's cheating, but I'm going to let Nate take it from here. I'm the New Hampshire president of Native Fish Coalition. We actually have three chapters, um, New Hampshire, Vermont, and Maine, and there's a national board um, with national members, um, and then we have state uh, councils. So Native Fish Coalition is an apolitical, all-volunteer, grassroots, donor-funded, nonprofit organization, and we're dedicated to the conservation and preservation of native fish. Our mission statement is to protect, preserve, and restore native fish populations through stewardship of the fish and their habitats. And you've been, a, since I've known you a few years, you've always been a big, like, really protective of native fishes. Like, that's one thing I've always known about you is, like, you're, like, like hardcore defender of the trout. You know, <laughs> like, if you're, like, a trout superhero sometimes. Well, I've been, I've been fishing up here since I was a little kid. And uh, to be honest, when I was young, um, I was always out. At that time, 
with you know spinning gear you know in search of wild brook trout and to me even at a young age they were special fish and um, of course I'm talking about um, our state fish the native brook trout um, which is one of our species of concern and we share that there are a lot a lot of actually nationally a lot of the country loves brook trout it's a big favorite I think eight states eight states have the brook trout as their state fish which yeah. I'm from New Jersey and I had no idea until I came to New Hampshire that New Jersey also has that as a state fish. Like, and and, and, and a, lot, a lot of people don't even know there are like fishing and or trout in New Jersey, but they New Jersey actually has 30 designated wild trout streams, which um, is what we're talking about today. In New Hampshire, we have just 16 formally designated wild trout waters, uh, 13 are streams, and three are ponds. Can you, before we get too deep, sure. define, so we talk native, we talk wild. Can you differentiate between the two, native, or three? We'll talk native, wild, and stockies. Like right. How do they, what's the variance? Very good question. Thank you. Um, in New Hampshire, we have two um, native trout or salmonoid species. We have many other uh, warm water native species like fall fish, um, you know, sculpin, things of that nature. Our two trout that are native in New Hampshire are brook trout and lake trout. And brook trout are our only what I, I call riverine uh, species that's native. And in, with lake trout, they're actually only native to specific waters. We were talking earlier about Silver Lake, which is one of those waters where lake trout are actually not just present, but they're native. Um, there are other water bodies They're barely present they are so hard to find. <laughs> <laughs> well you know what we know is that these apex predators they never seem highly present um, <laughs> not when you need them to be yeah. yeah but um so in new hampshire the the wild trout management program that's in place while it doesn't specifically state you know native trout in all cases, native brook trout are present. There are also in some cases in our waters and everywhere what are wild trout that are non-native. So brook, brook trout being native, they were here, came here from eggs, came, slid down from Labrador on glaciers, and they've been here ever since. Um, non-native trout like browns and rainbows are uh, emanate from previously stocked trout that then reproduced and for a trout to be truly wild the eggs have to have been hatched in the river that that fish is now present um, a lot of people will call holdover fish which is a stocked fish that's lives in the ecosystem for a full calendar year they'll say that's a wild trout well it's technically not it's a holdover and because it wasn't born in that water so that's that's kind of the difference between you know, stocked would be just thrown in the river maybe a month or a week or a day ago. Holdover made it through a calendar year. Wild, eggs born in the river. Trout, not indigenous to the area. And wild and native would be a trout that who's been here since before humans had any messing around with the ecosystem. Right, for eons. And, and I, I was told once by a biologist, and you can correct me if you've heard differently, sure. that... Um, the reason we say wild trout more in New Hampshire than native is because so many stocked fish over the years have reproduced and they've reproduced with the natives. Very it's good. very, very difficult yeah, or impossible good, uh, to really differentiate the two. So wild fish is really the, the term that's more commonly used. Yeah, and, and I, I call them native brook trout only because it's the native species. And um, since you probably interviewed that biologist, the studies that New Hampshire Fishing Game has done on wild brook trout populations have indicated that the genetics of those fish they've done genetic studies that the, the genetics of those fish are more closely in tune to native genetics than hatchery and they found very little hatch hatchery genetics in most of our wild brook trout populations which to me makes sense because a lot of the stocked fish that they study don't survive until spawning time. I mean, when we've done studies on some of our small streams in the fall that are that are stocked, we're finding like one out of a couple hundred fish is actually a stocked fish. So when you do the math, I mean, it's not surprising that the, the wild trout are the ones that keep reproducing. I think it's good news. Yeah. 
I, I think yeah, it's great. I news. love I love getting I, I still love I get excited about catching a wild or native brook trout. A little six inch trout sometimes is more exciting for me, you know, than a than a great big stocked fish because it's like that fish made it. That they're surviving. Yeah, and and when you catch a twelve inch one, it's it's like finding the whole. I don't grail. know. What, I don't know what that's like. <laughs> <laughs> well, you got to search for them, but they're they are around, and we like to see more. You know, more healthy brook trout populations, and kind of that's what this is all about. Yeah. I so guess. what are you, what are we doing about it? Uh, so right now, as I as I mentioned, we do have a wild trout program in New Hampshire, um, or you know, waters managed for wild trout. There are 13 streams, three ponds currently designated. And what we'd like to do is to get these waters better signage. So, so, so really it's an awareness campaign. These, these already exist. Exactly. And we want people to know they exist when they, they walk up to that pond. Yeah, we, we want to make sure people realize that this is, this is a, um, a special place and that it has, it has regulations to, that are implemented to maintain a wild self-sustaining water body these populations um, or these waters aren't stocked they're not supplemented and um, they are all catch and release um, but they're not just fly fishing only they are you could correct they're, they're not artif- fly fishing artificial only. Lures, I really like right? the regulations that the state's using because they don't restrict method they only restrict um, the the harmful use of bait or treble hooks or barbed hooks. So you're not restricting who can fish there. You're just restricting how they, you know, how they affect the fish. Gosh, I wish that was true in a lot more waters where they just said, you know what, we don't care if you're fly fishing or spinning, but yeah. barbless hooks, single hook, like just get us off. I think the emphasis fishing. should be on protecting the fish and not, um, you know, because I know waters in New Hampshire that are fly fishing only, but they let you kill five fish. And so yeah. to me, that's like, that's that's a terrible message. Well, it's, I mean, our limit to New Hampshire for a lot of species is over the top. Yeah, I really mean, it's high. crazy. I mean, there are some species of fish that are not native, but they're like like a white perch. They have a twenty five fish limit, and like that's that's yeah. a crazy amount of fish to keep. And five, I think five trout's a crazy amount of trout to keep. Yeah, especially native brook trout. Yeah, and that's why in these areas, um, the state the, the state considers it a wild trout management. Um, stream if it meets the following criteria. So it has to have a wild trout population of sufficient density, which they consider equal to or greater than 13 pounds a hectare. Um, It needs to be able to provide an angling opportunity without having to sustain or supplement a population with hatchery reared trout. It's basically if it meets 13 pounds a hectare or more, that should be the case. And, and a hectare is a pretty big space yeah. uh, to have 13 pounds of fish. I mean, it's it's not a hard threshold to meet. No, it's not. And some it's of the, our streams uh, that we've studied in the area have much more than that. Of course you know, they do. 44 pounds a hectare was one stream that we were looking at. So, And, and so you're looking at enough fish to support it, plus are those fish reproducing? Now, those are two big ones, right? Yeah. Obviously, if they're stock fish, it doesn't count. Right. So... When we've done studies with the state, the biologist will, if she thinks the fish is hatchery reared, that's another can of worms is how do you tell the difference? But our biologist is confident that she can tell the difference just looking at our trout. <laughs> uh, so she'll say, she might. you know, she <laughs> yeah. might, but I mean, she, that's how she's done it in the field. They do have, you know, do, do take scale samples from time to time to make sure. And actually, I, I correct, I'm going to correct that because last year she started clipping the fins. So we knew, we knew immediately if we had a hatchery fish. Yeah, we knew a lot of states, prior, a lot of states clip all the fins. They just, yeah. every stocked fish has a clipped fin. You just know right yeah. away. Yeah. And I, I think it would benefit anglers to know. Yeah. So last year we did that. And, you know, when we, we studied in the fall, one of the most highly stocked areas that we electrofished, we only, we did one run through and we had 51 fish. 41 were wild, 10 were stocked. It's amazing. You know, and that was a very, that was like the highest number of stocked fish we found in all of our sampling. So, um, and the coolest thing was some of those wild trout were nine, 10 inches, which is about the same size as a hatchery fish. Most people think, you know, the biggest, you know, from a recreational angling standpoint in New Hampshire, a lot of anglers think that the wild trout don't get big enough to provide recreational angling. And in a lot of places, that's where we have wild trout. They are small because they're relegated to smaller habitats. 
and places where they can't grow. Um, but if they're allowed to get into bigger habitat, they can grow. They have plenty of food in the rivers. As far as the criteria that New Hampshire uses in regard to their wild trout program, it is best in class. Um, other states have wild trout management that has less protection. In New Hampshire, they're protected um, with catch and release regulations. That's science. All the criteria is science-based. It's tackle, as I said, is restricted single barbless hooks, artificial lures and flies, and the season is closed after Labor Day to protect spawning fish. So it's that shorter season cause, because because a, a lot yeah. of the a lot of the trout ponds in New Hampshire go until what yeah. October, yeah, and then the rivers are open till I forget when as well, like somewhere near October yeah, as well. And, yeah. and some people said to me, you know, like you're a fishing guy, doesn't that bother you that you're not going to be able to fish on these waters? And you know, my answer to that is I'd rather the fish be there in the spring when I go back so that, you know, I have something, you know, that I know is there, mm -hmm. um, you know, with, with waters with stock trout, you know, you, you're looking at your, you're looking at your calendar going, I wonder when, uh, I'll be able to guide some trips. But, you know, there are waters with, um, that are managed other ways that you can still fish after Labor there's Day. There's plenty of places to fish. Yeah. There's, there's no, there's no shortage of places to fish. So, so our goal um, like, as we said before, is to inform anglers as to the self-sustaining status of these waters and the rules governing them using informational signs. Now, some of these water bodies already do have signs. In fact, they, they all should, mm -hmm. um, according to the state. You know, anything that has special regs in the state should have signs. Um, but as we know, a lot of these signs get torn down. They fall apart. Um, you know, they're made out of usually like a thin plastic. So our signs are, are going to be on um, 12 by 18 inch portrait. They're going to be on 0.07 aluminum. They're going to have UV ink. Um, and our plan is to get 60 of them to start. So we'll have 50 for approximately three per water. So and no matter where people are coming from, they see this nice, yeah. big, beautiful sign saying, hey, take care of these fish. They're special. And exactly. And we'll have five that we'll keep in, in reserve for New Hampshire Fish and Game maintenance and five in reserve for our own maintenance use. And is Fish and Game supportive of this uh, project? So that's, that's our next step. Um, our rollout plan, which we're currently in, is to secure co-sponsors. So if Fish Nerds wants to co-sponsor this event, um, you can do so, sign up on our website. Um, you can write us a letter of support, which we'd much, much appreciate. And right now we have letter, like six letters of support from different conservation organizations. Um, I think Tin Mountain, NH, New Hampshire Rivers, um, na the, the Nature Conservancy, North Country Angler, Lopsic Lodge, Mountain High Fly. And uh, there was one more, N NCRS, which is an environmental organization. We'll, we'll have to see if we can get the New England, New, New Hampshire chapter of the um, native, uh, the NANFA, the native, uh, North American Native Fishes Association to oh, send that a letter be because they've got some clout and absolutely. Yeah, I'll, I'll reach out to those guys for that you. would be huge. Yeah. And, if they, and they listen, so they could just do this. Yeah. So we want co-sponsors, um, to show that we have a lot of support and then, you know, we're going to go to the state and see if they want to help us co-sponsor this so we can get their emblem on the sign. Um, and then our next objective would be to get landowner permission in certain areas where need be to put up signs and then print signs so we know <laughs> we can put them up. Yeah, so it's a pretty, it's a pretty basic signs. ask. You're asking for support exactly. in, in writing, hey, here's a letter saying this is valuable. Yeah. A little bit of money to pay for the signage and then people to volunteer to help hang them all up. Yeah, I mean, and actually the best part is, I mean, we already – we already have enough donations to pay for these this these signs. So any donations would be to to you know for maintenance to print more signs in the future for you know to keep it going. Um, and our biggest thing is you know our biggest message we want to get across is we're not all all we want to do here is just promote the good that's already being done. So right, those are already that, protected. Yeah, show keep that protected. these these streams we have them here. You know, let's keep it the way it is so that they can be there. Those vile native trout will be there for our grandkids. Well, that's cool. And there's a lot of really cool stuff happening within this. And the website is? Uh, NativeFishCoalition.org. And we'll have links up at FishNerds.com with all of this stuff. And uh, Nate Hill from Hill Country Guide, thank you for uh, 
for coming on the show. What's your um your contact for the guide service? My website for the, uh, is www.whitemountainflyfishing.com. Um, the guide service is Hill Country Guides. And we'll put links up, of course, at fishners.com. And you do float trips, right? You do it in uh, yes, the, yeah. like in a, it's a, is that an inflatable? We have a ra- we have rafts. Uh, yep. Some of our guides, I was out with one of our guides yesterday. We just got a uh, inflatable drift boat. Oh. And it was actually pretty sweet. I uh, I fished on inflatable drift boats up in um, in uh, the Kennebec River in Maine. Yeah, and they're so fun. They're yeah, so they're nice. It was nice because we could still get it in the water, and that's always our challenge around here. We have high, it, uh, hard to access rivers, so the nice thing is when you get out there, you're not going to see too many people. And a lot of times, my clients will look at me with concern and say, "Where's everybody else?" And I'm like. Why don't you just keep fishing and have a good time and not yep. worry about that? <laughs> <laughs> don't worry, I'm here. And the reason they hire you is to, yeah. that way they don't have to worry about the things. You can worry, you can worry about the things and they can exactly. fish, and that's totally cool. And uh, so again, I'll put links up at fishners.com, and I'm going to ask your opinion on one more thing. Yes, and this is not a fishing. Well, it's a fishing thing. So hey, uh, you as a kid fish with worms, right? I did. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, as an adult, you never touch worms. Correct. Uh, tell me why. Well, the biggest reason I don't fish with worms, any, I mean, I, I don't even fish with spinning gear. And, and it's not because I think, um, you know, fly fishing is better or whatever. Total snob. It, it, maybe I'm a <laughs> snob. Um, but, you know, I, I still fish with spinning gear. I mean, I used to carry around, even when I was uh, in college, I'd carry a spinning rod and a fly rod. And I'd try to, you know, use the fly rod until I got frustrated or didn't catch fish. And then I would um, switch to the spinning rod. Um, but I, I've just naturally and through no, through no, um, particular brainwashing other than my own experience, got more and more into fly fishing, the challenge and the ability to do a variety of techniques to catch fish in all different conditions. It became kind of the challenge, like, all right, I can catch fish on dry flies in June, but can I catch a a brown trout in Saco in April when they only want to eat for like 10 minutes a day, you know, so to find that 10 minutes. Or yeah. So, yeah. so to me, the challenge is always trying to do it on a fly rod. Um, if I did spin fish, I'd probably do it with barbless lures just because it's, it's less, um, in, there's less impact on the fish. You know, when I fished with worms as a kid and the re- one of the reasons, the first thing I stopped doing in my progression as an angler was fishing with worms because I saw how many fish I was killing yeah, and well, I couldn't successfully release my fish when I caught them on a worm. So I kind of was like, eh, you know, if I want to catch fish here again, maybe I should at least use a rooster tail sure. and cut the, you know, and cut it down to one hook instead of the treble hook. And, you know, so I, I evolved just through my own fishing and seeing the impact I was having. Yeah. I find, I find, I do a lot of fishing with kids. Yeah, and I don't use bobbers. Yep. Because I think if you're fishing with a bobber and live bait dangling there, it's guaranteed when you catch a fish, they're gonna swallow the hook, get gill hooked, and they're gonna kill them. So we don't. Mm-hmm. We at least don't use the bobbers. We try to keep the fish yeah. alive, and we take the barbs off of our hooks. And we are using Very bait, cool. but it's um, I mean, we're not I, killing that and, many. You know, we are. They do. I, we we do kill some, but not, <laughs> I'm not gonna deny that. But not as many as one would if they were had bobbers and a big old treble hook or giant piece of bait well, on there. And I think the biggest, the most important thing with all fishermen is just to be thoughtful about the resource and and to try to understand how many fish of whatever species you're targeting exist and what, um, what, con- you know, conservative measures you can take to ensure that that fishery is going to keep going. Yeah. Know? Plus who wants blood all over the boat? Yeah. That's just gross. I mean, <laughs> I, I, I would, I used to go out and keep trout and then I realized that my fishing spots didn't work as well. You, ate all the you know, like yeah. I'm not catching anything here anymore, you know? Um, but you know, I, I'll go out and keep a couple of white perch or yellow perch where the, I know there's a good population of those fish and they taste I'm better keep than, 25. No, but they taste better than trout. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, they do. Yeah, they trout, do. Trout are, are not a great, you know, and, them, so and them, so. you know, I specifically, I know that they're, they're non-native and they're, they're not, you know, gonna, it's not going to be a negative impact on the, the fishery to to keep a warm water invasive species. Well, so. now, thank you for your input. Now, so next on the show, we've got a uh, PhD biologist who's an expert on worms coming on. So the rest of the show oh, is yeah, going to be all worm that. science. So yep. 
um, if you've enjoyed this you know, first the nice half, thing about like that, fishing so. with worms versus other types of bait is worms don't swim away if they fall off the hook. No. So, you know, <laughs> I, I, I worry more. You know, the thing I worry about most when it comes to uh, angling method is, is live minnows. Because, man, those, you know, you, you have a, a pristine wild brook trout pond up in the woods and somebody brings shiners or something or little mini. Maybe they caught some small sunfish or something to use as bait and those get away. Now you're looking at the catastrophe, the downfall of an entire ecosystem. Well, yeah. And I mean, that's, that's scary stuff. There are know? so many fishes in New Hampshire that got here as a bait fish. Yeah. And now they're just here. And yeah. so that's a whole other whole yeah. other podcast golden, we can do. Yeah. Shiners, smelting some more, all yeah. sorts of stuff. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Smelted. Well, in, in, in these landlocked and adverse fish, like like we can go on and on. But <laughs> oh, yeah. But anyway, hey, Nate, thanks for coming on the show. We're going to end it here. And uh, that's it. Thanks, Clay. This episode is also brought to you by you, our listeners. That's right, you. I said you. Uh, if you enjoy this show and think it's worth $1, then head to patreon.com slash fish nerds. Help us crowdfund this show. Big fat thank you to our newest supporters, Jonathan Sutter. Uh, thank you for giving us a dollar an episode. And the Jock and Nerd Podcast also gave us a dollar. Great podcast, by the way. Go to Jock and Nerd Podcast on your podcatcher and check it out. Both are giving $4 a month. To them, that's not a lot of money, but to me, it's a big amount of money, and we appreciate it. Four bucks times, you know, let's say a thousand listeners means I can quit my job and be a full time podcaster. So do it. If you give us two dollars an episode, uh, I will give you a fish nerds who rag. That's like a, uh, a head rag. Um, Five dollars an episode, an effing beanie. That's a hat. Uh, twenty five dollars an episode. I'll mention your business, like our friend Josh Lopes did at LopesTax.com. If you are in New England and need help on your taxes or with your money, Josh Lopes is the guy for you at LopesTax.com. And we've had listeners go to him and they like him just like we do. Anyway, head to Patreon.com and give us a freaking dollar. Patreon.com/slash/FishNerds. Give us a buck. My name is Dr. Worm. Good morning. How are you? I'm Dr. Worm. I'm interested in things, but I'm not a real doctor, but I am a real worm. I am an actual worm. I live like a worm. I like to play the drums. I think I'm getting good, but I can handle criticism. I'll show you what I know. And you can tell me if you think I'm getting better on the drums. But I'm not a real doctor, but they call me Dr. Worm. You're welcome. That's for uh, They Might Be Giant song. I could not get permission to play it, so I sang it for you. Next up, we have Doc Martin, the great Doc Martin, with Dr. Snyder the Worm. Doctor, great. We're going to learn more than we ever wanted to know about worms. If you're a worm dunking fisherman, this is your show, A Little Worm Natural History. And here we go. <laughs> Hi Fish Nerds, this is Doc Martin here today. Um, I got to see a really cool article that was shared on our Facebook page and it happened to be about earthworms and it turns out that I know a guy for that and so I thought it would be a really fun time for us to learn about earthworms together and so I have asked Dr. Bruce Snyder to be a guest this week. Are you there Bruce? Hello. Hey, I'm how's here. it going? <laughs> it's it's good. How are things in so, the fish world? Things are very fishy in the fish world, as you can imagine. <laughs> and how are things in the worm world? They are excellent. And so where are you at these days? Uh, so I am currently uh, an assistant professor at Georgia College, in right smack in the middle of Georgia. All right, cool. And so you have been working with worms for a while. Yeah, I've Is been that, working. Yeah. I've been working with earthworms for almost fifteen years now. And so now I have always thought, at least, or students and other people, earthworms is just one kind of thing. How accurate is that? <laughs> Uh, that's, I think, one of the really common misconceptions is that there is there's only the earthworm. Uh, and it turns out there are actually 3,500 different species of earthworms globally. Uh, they wow. Have, yeah, they have a huge range in size uh, from just a couple of inches long to uh, upwards of 10 feet long. Uh, and there are even some that are, are really colorful. There are some in the Philippines that are all black and they have 
blotches of white and yellow on them. They're sometimes called the fried egg worm. The fried egg worm. Yeah, they look like they have little tiny fried eggs all over their bodies. <laughs> it's, a, it's just a, a strange little camouflage thing that they do. Oh, that's wonderful. Now, is the do you happen to know, Is are they mimicking something specific? It's not really uh, well understood. Um, in fact, it's, only, it's a brand new species. It was only uh, described and given a name in the last 10 years. Wow, that's incredible. So how many of these little earthworm friends live in North America about? So right now we know of about 175 or so species that live in at least the U.S. and Canada. And there's some more in, in the, the North American part of Mexico. Uh, and those are just the ones we know about. We're, every time we go sampling just about, we find either species that are new to science or species that are new to North America. Wow. So how, so when all did this kind of research in this diversity of earthworms start? Because it sounds like it's relatively recent. Well, people have been studying earthworms in North America for a couple hundred years. Mm -hmm. uh, but a big chunk of the earthworm fauna is not actually from North America. So we have uh -huh. species here, about a third of that 170 or so species is not from North America. Many of those are European, uh, and a lot of them are Asian as well. And we've been, as humans, transporting earthworms and other soil fauna around the world for you know, as long as we've been moving th things around the world. So European earthworms probably came over with European settlers. Uh, and so there's been a lot of research into earthworm invasions over the last uh, there's been a big push over the last probably 20 or so years. Wow, that's super cool. And so there's, we said one third are invasive, roughly? Yeah, one third are not from North America. And usually when we talk about invasive species, we're uh -huh. thinking about species that are not only not from the place where they're found, but they're also usually causing some sort of harm to an ecosystem or some so sort now, of major, major changes. Right, that's a... Great. Thank you for that. Um, and my next question is going to be based on that. So when you're studying these new species that are not originally from North America, um, where is the research on, are these a problem? Should we be concerned about any of these for any reason? Absolutely. Uh, and this is where I think a lot of the connection to the fish comes in, you know, since we're, uh, Talking, you know, this is a fish podcast, and so <laughs> to we do a lot of weird stuff. So that. it's okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's still it's still an honor to be invited as a, a non fish person to to come and talk to fish people. Uh, <laughs> but most of the earthworms that are used for bait are non native, and so interesting. Um, this is part of the way that they get transported around. You know, you you go to the bait store, you buy your night crawlers or your red wigglers both of which are European species most of the time. Um, there's not there's not perfect alignment between the, the sort of common trade names and the, the Latin species names. Uh, but you go and you buy those and you go fishing. And then if you have some bait left over, I mean, what do you do with your bait? Hopefully think, you are responsible and you dispose of it properly, but I'm I, guessing that's not the answer that we hear very often. <laughs> yeah, I, I would I would hope that people are, but I think most people don't realize that there are, like you said, more than one type of earthworm, and that there mm -hmm. are, well, I guess if, if you're an angler and you use earthworms for bait, you know that. Uh, but, you know, there are just these few different kinds. Uh, well, when you take that bait and you dump it on land, then oftentimes those earthworms survive. And then now you've introduced a new species to an ecosystem, and it's going to function a little differently than some of the other earthworms. And so it can potentially change the way that whole ecosystem functions. And so we've seen this uh, a lot in the place that's probably had the most impact is up in the northern forests of you know, New York, Michigan, Minnesota, Wisconsin, uh, and up into Canada, uh, where a lot of those ecosystems don't have native earthworms. Uh, they were glaciated, 
So glaciers came through 15 to 20,000 years ago and basically erased all of the soil fauna. And now the only earthworms that are there are ones that we have introduced. And when those European earthworms get into those systems, they destroy the forest floor. They'll eat up all of that leaf litter uh, and it can cause major changes to those ecosystems. Wow, I had no idea. Yeah. And we do have native earthworms in lots of other parts of North America. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, in, in the southeast where I am, we, we have native earthworms and European ones and Asian ones. And there's, it, their effects are not as clear, but you can still see effects. So I did a lot of my research in the Smokies, uh, looking at an Asian earthworm that was moving in. And I also study millipedes. And you could see effects on the millipede communities when these worms would move in. Um, and they're, they're probably competing for space and, and different types of resources uh, as well. And interestingly, so it's they're competing with the millipede, which I assume those millipedes are native? Question mark. Most of the millipedes are yes. There are Most a few invasive. Are. There are a few invasive millipedes as well. Um, mm -hmm. Likewise, some some European and some Asian ones. Uh, a lot of a lot of the soil fauna that I think most people are familiar with are probably non-native, uh, especially if you've grown up in an urban area. Uh, so I used to. You know, as a kid, I played with uh, roly polies. Uh, you know, uh, people have lots of different names for them: wood lice, uh, hill bugs, mm -hmm. um, isopods is the is the group, the Latin name for the group that they're in. And most of those isopods are European. So, Interesting. yeah, it's something that that you don't really think about too much until you start to study them. But every group of soil fauna has a couple of non-native species, um, but with the earthworms we have seen probably the biggest impacts in our, our ecosystems. And so can you describe what those impacts are just a little bit for me? So it can range pretty widely depending on which ecosystem and which species it is. Sure. Uh, certainly as I said in the, in the Smokies what we saw was declines in millipede, uh, the number of millipede species and the number of individual millipedes that we had. Uh, in those northern forests, they'll, I, I mentioned they'll, they'll eat the leaf litter. So in, in those systems, mm -hmm. you have a big buildup of leaf litter or uh, partially decomposed leaf litter, which they sometimes call duff. And those species will eat through that. And you're left with essentially bare soil. Uh, and that can cause problems with erosion. And there's a lot of different groups of organisms that live in that leaf litter and all of those are going to be pretty negatively affected. Wow, and so then uh, on negative and positive uh, effects of these earthworms, of course I've always heard, heard, you know, my mother said or old wives tale or whatever, the earthworms are good for the soil. So in this case, well, you need a little clause there of maybe if they're native. <laughs> Yeah, it, in, in ecology, the, off, the answer is often, it depends. And, and that's definitely <laughs> yeah. the situation here. So, so it, you're going to you're gonna love this, because mm. the nerds always give me a bunch of shit whenever I say it depends, so they're going to they're gonna love it. <laughs> yeah, it, and it's true. It, it depends. It, it depends on what you're trying to do with the particular place that you're, you're focused in. So earthworms mm -hmm. do... Uh, there's different groups of earthworms, we won't get into the details of that, but a, a lot of the earthworms are making burrows and moving up and down in the soil, and those burrows allow air and water to get into the soil at a faster mm -hmm. rate, which in a lot of situations is good. Right? That's what you want to see in your garden. That's mm -hmm. probably what you want to see in your agricultural field. Uh, they're doing a lot of that by eating and and pooping out what they've eaten, which for earthworms is called casting. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, that's good if you're trying to get lots of decomposition, uh, trying to get that leaf litter to break down. If you have a golf course, you don't want earthworms that are casting on the surface, right? Because they're, they're gonna, you want a nice flat green and to have, be able to have golf balls roll across that. And having little lumps of earthworm poo is not really ideal in that situation. 
So and, no and earthworms for golf. No, well, yeah, <laughs> you, you probably don't want those on, on your green. You know, do you want them in, in the rough? Maybe. I don't know. I don't, mm -hmm. I don't really golf. Uh, Me neither. But, <laughs> but it, it really depends on that specific application, right? The, that sort of change in the soil surface texture is also bad in some irrigation ditches. Uh, or for or not irrigation, but drainage ditches. So if you're trying to get water to flow quickly, you don't want s that texture on the surface. Uh, so it's it, so it sort of depends. You know, in in those northern forests, it's a really bad thing to increase the decomposition rates so much that you lose the whole forest floor. And no, nobody right. else is getting any of that. Ish. Right, so so it, it takes it, it's potentially taking away from some native fauna that might be eating leaves, uh, mm -hmm. but the bigger problem is that it, it expands to the whole ecosystem, and you lose tree seedlings can't regenerate if there's no leaf litter. Uh, rare plants go away because they don't have that leaf litter to live in. Uh, there have been a number of studies recently that have looked at interactions between earthworms and salamanders, and Often it looks like when you change that that leaf litter soil surface habitat, you're also changing the way salamanders interact with that habitat. And so, wow. uh, an earthworm that that comes in that's new to an environment, you'd think, oh, well, maybe that's more salamander food. But sometimes these earthworms are bigger than the salamanders. Sometimes they're more active. Uh, a lot of the Asian ones have really crazy defensive. Uh, patterns and so they'll they move in more of a snake-like motion and they can often put out some sort of stinky fluid or the ones that I worked with uh, will self amputate their tail and so huh. that's always very exciting when you pick up an earthworm and all of a sudden you have two <laughs> earthworms in your hand uh, and the first time it happens even for an ecologist it it's startling and you drop it. <laughs> and usually the front half wriggles away and is okay, and then you're left with uh, a little tail piece, which uh, for a salamander or a, a predator of some kind is probably okay, and for someone trying to ID that species is not very useful. Uh, the important part got away. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so, um, in general, you mentioned you don't want to get too much into the different types of earthworms, which is fine, but I was wondering what the overlap of all these different species are. Are they all kind of doing similar things? Or is that too much of a generalization? I think, I think in some ways there, you could generalize and say, yes, they're, they're doing these, these same basic things, but just like any group of organisms, every species is doing something a little bit different. They all have their unique, uh, in ecology we call it a niche. Every, every organism has a unique niche, and uh, that niche could be defined in lots and lots of different ways. And so, for, so, well, in thinking back to those general different types of, of earthworms, uh, mm -hmm. there are some that live up on the surface and they eat surface litter. There are some that live down deeper in the soil and eat mostly soil. Uh, and there are some that make these big up and down uh, vertical burrows. Um, and they'll eat, they'll grab leaf litter off the surface and pull it down into their burrow. And those are sort of three general ecological types that we, we think about usually. Uh, not every earthworm even fits into those three types. There are some that sort of will... Uh, they won't live just in leaf litter, they'll sort of go up and down between leaf litter and the soil, and sort of stitch back and forth between those two layers. So, even just in their general feeding habits, you can have these big differences. Wow, that's really neat. <laughs> Especially going back to thinking, most most people, I think, think of the one earthworm, and there's only one. So to have, not only is there hundreds of species in North America, they're all doing quite you know, different-ish things depending on exactly who you're looking at. Yeah, and, and most people are familiar with or think about night crawlers, which are uh, mm -hmm. a European species. The uh, the Latin name is Lumbricus terrestris, and it's it's one that's really well studied. Darwin studied uh, that specific earthworm. It's the one now, that's used Darwin for earthworm was dissections. The one that, 
Yeah, Darwin, when he studied that one, he's the one that actually looked at how long it took them, uh, what was it, out his backyard until they covered up um, some of the layers out there, and he, he monitored it for a very long time. Is that is that right? Yeah, so he actually mm -hmm. set out stones in this yard at, at Down House where he lived for a long time, and mm -hmm. uh, he, he monitored the, those stones, and eventually they they sank into the soil, basically because the action of the earthworms in turning over the soil was letting those stones settle down in there. And so he actually monitored over time how, how those stones could get buried. So earthworms have the potential of making major shifts in, in the way soils function. Uh, and of course, you know, those sorts of shifts can change how neighboring aquatic systems function as well. Um, I have a quick question for you, since we're talking about the recognizing earthworms and stuff. I know you do a lot of kind of outreach and help citizen scientists and things like that. And what can like just the average person do? So like maybe the fisher people listening to this, maybe, you know, if you were one of those bait dumpers, maybe we're not going to be anymore. That's a good one. What else? Yeah, so definitely I think the, the easiest thing is to be responsible with your bait. Uh, I used to recommend that if you if you have aquatic bait like minnows that you dump it on land and if you have terrestrial bait like worms that you dump them in the water. I used to recommend that. I don't anymore because uh, a lot of the Asian earthworms are pretty good swimmers. Huh. Uh, they, they don't drown very easily and so and the soil is very wet too so they're used to being in, in liquid. It's just uh, so if you dump them, even in the middle of a lake, some of those earthworms have the potential to swim to shore and find a habitat they can be in. So not, not dumping bait at all would be my recommendation for that. Um, it may be a little bit more work. Uh, you may have to put them in the freezer for an extended period of time, at least a couple of days to make sure everyone's really truly dead. Uh, but that's, that's my recommendation for that. Uh, definitely talking about it and asking questions about, okay, what what are these worms? Where are they from? Uh, those, I think, are important to get people thinking about this issue. Very uh, cool. Yeah. Do you have any links or anything that we I could share with uh, the fans? Like could, we could put them up on our website and go check out some of your stuff and or some important research that you'd like the nerds to read about on our spare time. <laughs> um, I'll have to think about that. I so in my previous position, I had done a, a big citizen science project where we're, we're trying to just get a better idea of what earthworm distributions are. Mm -hmm. um, and so I had done a, a big project called Earthworms Across Kansas, and uh, I'll have to check and see if that website is still up and running, but it was pretty successful. We, we learned a lot about what species were there. We found a lot of species that we didn't know were in Kansas, and of the ones we did know, we found all of these new distribution records. Uh, there's a really good program out of Minnesota called uh, Worm Watch. And I can send you the link to that, because that uh, they've done some distribution work, but they've also tried to convince people to uh, not release their earthworms. That's been the, a big focus of that project. Uh, and I'm not sure what the current status of that one is either, but it I think it's worth checking out. Uh, well, cool. Well, I, we'll post those links on uh, the, this episode's uh, Facebook page or iTunes page or whatever internet page it is <laughs> so that way folks can go listen and they can click on those links and check that stuff out that'll yeah. be great um do you have any any last parting fun facts or tidbits that you want to share about worms with the fish nerd nation so i mentioned that almost all of the bait earthworms are non-native right mm -hmm. mainly european and asian but there is one place where the only one place that I know of, there may be others, but there's one, one place, one area in the Florida Panhandle where most of the bait are actually native species. And there's a bait harvesting industry based around this one species. Uh, and the, the technique that they use for collecting the bait is 
pretty unique. So it's called earthworm grunting. And essentially what you do is you hammer a wooden stake into the ground and you use a piece of metal. Uh, like I, I have a, a piece of wood and an old leaf spring from a, from a car. Uh, and I hammer, hammer the wood in and you rub the metal across the top and it makes vibrations. And the soil there is really, really sandy, and they, the vibration carries through that sandy soil. And earthworms feel that, and they think that a mole is coming after them to eat them. And so oh, no. when, you, when you live underground, the best thing to do to get away is to go up to the surface. Oh. Ah. And so this is wonderful. When you, when you do this in a place where... Uh, it's, it's a fire regulated system and, and they really like the recently burned stuff and so you go to a place that's recently burned and you find a good spot and you start grunting and within minutes there are hundreds of worms up on the surface and these worms are huge they're 12 to 14 inches long oh my gosh and, and they're just <laughs> I want to go do that everywhere. It's, <laughs> it's amazing it's a, a ton of fun so um, you've done it I've yeah I've done it I've been down there a few times and I've done it um, and I've you know, try to get some research going on on that species to learn more about it, uh, but it's but there's a, a bait industry set up based on that, and so you can go down there and you can buy uh, Diplocardia mississippiensis is the name of the species, uh, and you can you can buy those worms, and they actually have an earthworm grunting festival every year. In fact, it's probably <laughs> I need to look that up. I think it's about this time of year that they have the grunting festival. Oh, that's festival. fantastic! And I went to that once, and and you know they've got grunting competitions and all kinds of fun earthworm related stuff so it's a really it's nice to know that it's possible to set up those sorts of native species based uh, systems so it that is gives, gives me some super hope. cool <laughs> <laughs> well thank you so much yeah thank you for having me this has been fantastic i had i had no idea that earthworm grunt harvesting was even a thing <laughs> It's, it's so. unique, for sure. Well, that's fantastic. And we'll put up those links for everybody. And Dr. Snyder, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to come and talk to the fish nerds about worms. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> wow, thanks, uh, Docs. Two Docs for the price of one on the Fish Nerds Podcast. You heard it here first. I'm always surprised when uh, smart people want to hang out with me or be on my show. Stay tuned after the closing of this show for your local fish reports. If you want to call one in, call 607-378-FISH and leave your report for us. We will add to the show. Uh, plug whatever you want in that time. It's fine. Uh, so that's it. You've listened to a bunch of fishers when you definitely should have been fishing. Big thanks to our families for supporting us while we podcast. Go on Fishing Quest and do all the silly things that nerds do. Big fat thanks to Nate Hill from the Native Fish Coalition, Dr. Snyder and Doc Martin. Of course, uh, thanks to everyone who's listening. We love you. And until next time, follow the code of the fish nerds. Spawn early and often. Avoid the links of the space pad and swim against the current and chance you get. Now time for the local fishery. Howdy, folks, howdy. This is the Fish Nerds correspondent, Mike, from the Average Joe Fishing Show down here in Easton, Pennsylvania. I just want to let everybody know we kicked off the season last weekend with trout opening day. We had a great day. Fish were biting, and we were using all kinds of bait. I did well with trout magnet crankbaits and Joe's flies in line spinners. Old reliable fathead minnows were hot, too. Going to be getting ready for more fishing. We haven't hit the lakes or the ponds yet, but we will be there soon. Actually, down here in next cut, well, in a couple of weeks, the shad are going to be running, so we will be taking part in the shad fishing tournament in a couple of weeks. So stay tuned for updates and info on what is going on in Eastern PA. This is Mike from the Average Joe Fishing Show. Don't have to be a pro to go. You can check out my site on Facebook, Average Joe Fishing Show, or my page, AverageJoeFishingShow.net, the Average Joe Fishing Show, Eastern PA. Thanks for listening, and have a great day. Fish on!